It takes between 90 and 150 days to make a year's worth of legislation in the state of Connecticut, depending on whether there's a short legislative session or a long one. But sometimes, for a myriad of reasons, the legislature is called back into a special session. Right now, Connecticut is looking to fix issues with the car tax bill. But at CCM, public policy is a never-ending process, and right now, even as the policy team works through the special session, they are already prepping for next year. CCM's Director of Public Policy and Advocacy, Brian O'Connor, joins us to talk about why these issues are so important for towns and cities, and why it's relevant to you. Municipal Voice is a Connecticut Conference of Municipalities podcast in collaboration with WNHH LP 103.5 FM. I'm your host, Matt Ford. As always, be sure to give us a like and let us know what you're thinking in the comments. CCM's Municipal Voice podcast continues to present a key forum on important state local issues. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the consensus views of CCM or member municipal leaders. Brian, thanks for being here with us today. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to it. So uh, last time you were on was opening day of uh, the session. We were live from the Capitol. Um, and here we are. We're past the regular session into special session. So right out of the gate, why are we in a special session? Uh, you know, it's it's interesting, you know, just to kind of back up a little bit. This past year, you know, I, there was thousands of bills that were proposed. Mm -hmm. And in the end, they ended up passing 173 and okay. two were vetoed. Uh, mm -hmm. by the governor and you know out of that there was some unfinished business um, mm -hmm. that some of the bills that they uh, put forward were were proposals that did have a public hearing mm -hmm. two of which we supported um but uh, there was some changes at the end of session they just ran out of time in order to complete them mm -hmm. uh, the first one i just want to bring up is the motor vehicle assessment Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, this was very important to us. This is actually something that uh, we've been working on for probably three or four years now. Yeah. Um, they ended up passing uh, some legislation a couple of years ago that was problematic. Was that um, the uh, the so, cap? When the, no, it's not the cap, but the okay. cap does come into play, okay. actually. What it did was, long story short, the problem that we had with it uh, going forward, the bill that passed in 2022, is that it would have assessed commercial vehicles as personal property. And what mm -hmm. that would have done is that would have taken those commercial vehicles outside of the cap. Right now, let's say you're in the um, city of Hartford, mm -hmm. you're and you have a small business, you have uh, a commercial vehicle, it's taxed at 32.46. Okay. Cap applies. If the if the bill that that was remedied during the special session didn't take effect mm -hmm. or or did take effect, it would be uh, taxed at its at its mill rate, which I believe is around uh, sixty eight mills mm. or so. So it basically would have doubled the tax on those commercial vehicles. Yeah, uh, no one wanted that. Also, there was some logistical concerns because everyone thought we were going to remedy it mm -hmm. and uh, amend it and make it work. And uh, so they didn't have the software built. Uh, DMV wasn't ready for it. Um, so it would have had a whole host of problems. Mm -hmm. um, but luckily, you know, what happened was the Senate put in an amendment mm -hmm. that would have eliminated uh, or allowed, I should say, enabled municipalities to eliminate the car tax. Okay. Good concept. But what happened was, is it wasn't um, basically accepted by the House. So when they sent it back to the House, mm -hmm. the House didn't act on it. And that's why we needed the special session. So an important component of the bill that was uh, passed the other day is it does allow towns to differentiate its car tax from its regular mill rate. So, okay, you know, but it has to be lower. They can't raise it and try to grab money through the um, reimbursement that the state provides above the, the uh, car tax cap. But it does allow them to reduce it below the regular level of their mill rate, all the way down to zero mills if they okay. wanted to. So currently, property tax, whether it's your house or your car, it's the same rate or what? Uh, you know what it was is you could differentiate. They made it clear that you could. And now OPM has to notify each year municipality, two municipalities that you can do this. Mm -hmm. Some towns have already availed themselves of a differentiated car tax, but uh, not on a large scale basis. Yeah. 
so that opens up a lot of possibilities for our members to kind of customize things to their area, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. They they can look at uh, their population and to determine what is the uh, the best process. The most appropriate the other, sort of uh, level of taxation on stuff. Because I know we've talked in the past about this being kind of a regressive tax the way it was structured before, right? Yes, that's why the car tax cap was put in because again if you look at some uh some communities whose mill rates are you know in the 40s or even 50s um you know that honda civic is getting taxed at that mill rate of 40 or 50 just like the land yeah yeah and, and another that same uh car would be mm -hmm. taxed at a much lower rate in a in a different more affluent town yeah the other thing, too, I want to point out about this bill is that it changes the depreciation schedule. So okay. right now we're on the National Association of Dealers list, which changes every year. So okay. what we're what is proposed and what we supported was moving it to the MSRP, you know, the um, price that you pay or, or it's listed at a dealership mm -hmm. and it'll depreciate. The first year will be 85 percent and then 5 percent down to uh years uh, i guess it'll go down five percent a year mm -hmm. down to uh, 15 percent for years mm -hmm. 15 through 19 and then um year 20 that's what it is uh for the remainder of of the life of the car okay that's so cool. it's much more predictable yeah mm -hmm. and, and it gets rid of the volatility that we saw during the pandemic when used car prices went through the roof mm -hmm. yeah yeah the now, fluctuation there i got you yeah yeah, now they're dropping precipitously. So uh, it it takes out that volatility too, and it's more predictable not only for the for the taxpayer but the communities, uh, the town too. Yeah, town, yeah. Well, I know we talk about you know the the car tax, and everyone thinks repeal the car tax automatically. Thinks, wow, that's a great idea. But there are issues around that for some of our members because a large part of their revenue stream comes from property tax, right? Yeah, if you look at the car tax, it ranges roughly twelve to fifteen percent of their um, of their revenue that they mm -hmm. collect from property taxes. So, if you shift that over, inevitably, where is it going to go? It's going to go to real estate. It's going to go to commercial and uh, industrial properties as well as personal property. So, mm -hmm. a town can do that. Actually, under this bill, it yep. makes it clear that they can do that. Um, but again, they have to weigh those uh, cost benefits. But it, it's left to the town to figure out how to pay for it, essentially. Yeah, they still got to operate. Yeah. And the other the other thing, too, that, you know, we, we bring up uh, when we're advocating, you know, you need to have a re different revenue sh source. We, we mm. don't think it's a good idea to to shift it all to the real estate or personal property. Uh, the thought is, is let's look at revenue diversification, see mm. if there's other opportunities for towns to um, seek different revenue sources yeah. and also uh, operate uh, their towns. Because if you if you don't, you know we're 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 all looking at housing as a key issue. If you shift more property taxes on into real estate or residential properties, mm -hmm. you're making it that much more unattainable. Yeah, and there, Connecticut is kind of uniquely dependent on the property tax, right? Like there's other states that don't do it the way we do, right? Many towns have. Um, property taxes but I, I think the key difference is is that we don't have county government mm -hmm. so we're responsible for education so a lot of our property taxes are going toward education where other towns um, you know funded differently mm. and only and have a much smaller burden when it comes to property taxes so in the, some of those other places the county almost acts like a regional sort of thing for like some school systems and stuff like that Yes, many we're we're rare in Connecticut as far as uh, municipalities being responsible for the for, for a lot of that stuff. Okay, children. yeah, most of most education uh, throughout the country is paid for uh, through county government, county in the level. Other, yeah, in some counties they're able to do an income tax, sales tax, so they have different revenue streams uh, rather than solely on the property tax, like us. Interesting stuff. Um, so when we're in a special session, can they just like start calling bills like in a regular session? Is there anything that municipal officials or the public should be concerned about with uh, this year? 
you know, this year it did expand. Um, you know, at first they were just going to do the property tax fix or the motor mm -hmm. vehicle assessment fix, but then expanded beyond that. Uh, there was a state historic preservation bill that we were very mm -hmm. much in support of uh, that ultimately was included. And then, um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, Christmas again for some people, Christmas in July or Christmas in June in this case, where some people are like, they they didn't get it over the finish line, but they want to, or some things have popped up between the end of session, which was, oh. uh, I think it was June 8th and, and uh, today, yeah. uh, or I guess it would be the 28th, uh, 26th and 27th of last week. And one of those was the Regional Water Authority in South Central Connecticut. Now they're able to bid on um, aquarium water which they created as kind of an authority to give them permission to bid on it. Mm -hmm. uh, we anticipate that that's a big deal. Um, yeah. Where do, where do we land on that one? That one, we, we actually um, stayed neutral on it. We okay. didn't advocate one way or the other. We, we have communities in the South central region that were very much in support, uh, but, but because it wasn't a statewide bill, mm -hmm. we, we sort of stayed out of it. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, and we allowed uh, them to kind of work through some of the issues uh, that were going forward. And I think the key thing about that is, is that you know we, we have to, you know, we're going to monitor it as it goes through the process. But they couldn't wait until the start of the next session, which is January, because I uh -huh. think Aquarian is going to put it out to bid to be uh, for sale uh, within the next couple of weeks. Got so it. they wanted... Uh, the regional water authority wanted the uh, the ability to at least contemplate bidding on it yeah and this gives them that opportunity along with some of the private uh interests as well that'll be interesting to see how that turns out um, yeah it affects just so i can put this out yeah. there i think it affects 59 communities uh is the territory for aquarian so and then you have the towns that are part of the south central regional authority it's a it's going to impact a lot of communities. Yeah. Yeah, it's a whole whole area that it's going to impact. Yeah, mostly Fairfield County and South Central yeah. and New Haven area. Um, so once the session's over, the special session, uh, the work for you guys isn't over. Um, we're already starting to think about policy proposals. Um, and as a lot of people know, we're a member-based organization representing 168 out of 169 towns uh, in the state. Each, you know, has their own viewpoints, issues, problems. How does a policy committee process work to build one voice for CCM? It's very, you know, that's a great question. We we actually um, started our process actually the week of special session. Um, Was that we, by design we, or just lined up that way? Yeah, we always, it, 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 not by design, no, it just lined up that way. Typically, what we try to do is start our process the week before, for lack of a better day, July 1. We like to get two things we do, um, actually three. At our board meeting in um, at the end of June, we basically approved all our co-chairs and vice chairs mm -hmm. for the 24-25 session coming up. That's the first thing we do. The next thing we do is solicit ideas from our from our members, mm -hmm. seeing what issues uh, they want us to consider. We have five policy committees. We have a basically an education, appropriations, and taxes subcommittee, our policy committee, okay. municipal law and labor relations, uh, land use, housing, transportation, and economic development environmental management and energy, and then the uh, public health and public safety and human services. So we have five policy committees. Okay. And we get, look for legislative ideas. Again, we try to get stuff that has a statewide impact mm -hmm. rather than something that's unique to just one municipality. We'll, we'll entertain those, um, but they're less likely to make it on our final agenda. And the other thing we do too, uh, we just sent this out uh, last week was a solicitation of who CEOs want to appoint to various committees, mm -hmm. uh, those committees that I mentioned, and, and they have the opportunity to assign people, uh, if not themselves, um, policy leaders within their communities to to participate. That's great. And for some people at home who don't listen all the time, when we talk about CEOs, we're talking about mayors for selectmen, town managers, and town managers, and, yeah. and town administrators. Yeah, they get to make the appointments, 
And then the process starts. So we, we allow that to play out over the next month. Mm -hmm. And then starting uh, mid August to late August, policy committees actually meet. And the idea is to get some of these ideas fleshed out at the policy committee level. They make approximately three recommendations to the full mm -hmm. legislative committee. And that starts in September, October. And then we um, have our members uh, determine the priorities at our convention in December. So December, so we still got a, a ways on that, but at this point, you're starting to get some of the early stuff in, you know, you've been doing this a while. I think you can kind of see which way the wind is blowing. Is there any yes. issues that are kind of already bubbling towards the surface that you're seeing? Yeah. You know, there, there's, um, housing is probably going to be another key issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, they did pass, uh, an omnibus bill this year, uh, that we did support and, and did make some uh, strides toward making housing more affordable, but it, mm -hmm. it wasn't just affordable housing. It was all housing. Okay. You know, Connecticut has a, a housing stock issue right now um, that uh, they're trying to uh, alleviate. Um, Not enough houses for yeah. people moving in. Yeah. We're, you know, you, you have that, uh, the demand issue, you know, mm -hmm. where you have like, let's look at um, EB down in the Groton area in London yeah. where they have so many jobs that they're trying to fill, but they, they need to put people in them, mm -hmm. you know, in housing. Uh, and I don't believe they have enough stock down there yet. And, uh, you know, but they're working toward it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been some, uh, you know, progress in that front. So you have that as a key issue. And then, you you know, you, you have some people moving in from New York mm -hmm. uh, who find Connecticut a great place to, you know, raise your kids and yeah. live. And uh, so that's that's uh, that's also uh, providing some of the influx. Yeah. You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM. It's not hard to see why housing would be an issue for the towns and cities of Connecticut, but there's quite an array of opinions between them on how best to tackle that issue. How can our process give the legislature something that works? Is there power in an organization that represents nearly 100% of any constituency? Yeah, our role to play right now, you know, we're very uh, much in support of local control. We want to have local input. Mm -hmm. uh, we also understand that, you know, maybe we can look at some of these areas uh, and provide some incentives for towns to do certain policy goals that uh, some of the advocates are producing. Mm -hmm. Like this year, I'm going to give you a for instance, um, was that there's an incentive now for towns to do what we call middle housing. That's duplexes, mm -hmm. triplexes, and quadplexes. And if a town puts those in as of right, Mm -hmm. uh, within their local zoning ordinances and they actually get some bill, mm -hmm. they get points toward their 830G uh, moratoria. Okay. So it, there's an incentive there where, again, you're providing market rate housing. Uh, it's just not feasible really to have those be affordable for the developer. You just mm -hmm. don't have enough units to offset the cost of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it does provide, again, that middle housing, that workforce housing. That, so this is uh, not, not the, the so-called affordable housing, low-income housing. It's not for rich people. It's that middle ground right there. Correct. And giving them credit towards meeting meeting their goals for housing. Is yeah, the, uh, the 830G, yeah. So it would um, points toward their moratorium that they're, that uh, many communities are seeking. And, you know, the, there's a, an argument to be made that some of these properties, even though they're not deed restricted, should mm -hmm. count toward uh, affordable housing. So this was kind of a, a, a compromise between those two thoughts. Yeah. Um, so another thing that came up, I, I think, is, or is coming up is solid waste. It's been kind of around for a while as an issue. Uh, and we've talked about this on the podcast before with a variety of stakeholders, um, town officials, environmental orgs. But, you know, there's no way around it. There's something has to be done. Are there any solutions on the horizon? This past year, uh, during the legislative session, we we advocated for two. Uh, pro well, it was one proposal, but two uh, ideas. One was what we call a waste characterization study. The last okay. time DEEP did this was 2015. Let's find out how people's 
uh, what's in the waste? You know, mm -hmm. what do we, what, what will we find? And a lot has changed, obviously, since 2015. Mm -hmm. People are also recycling a little bit more. There's uh, more organics. Uh, towns are, con you know, doing that on some Compost level. Composting and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Composting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, many of our larger facilities, even our secondary schools, are starting to take out uh, some of the organics or food waste scraps. Mm hmm I know in uh, some towns like Hamden, they were doing things where they were uh, collecting uh, clothes and cloth in yes. special bags to re recycle that stuff too. That was interesting. That's a heavy weight uh, yeah. that you take out of the waste stream, and uh, to the to the extent that you can um, reuse it, uh, recycle it, you know that that's um, in the best interest of everybody. Yeah. So we were able to successfully. Uh, within a bond authorization, secure uh, $600,000 to uh, conduct this waste characterization mm -hmm. study. We actually have a meeting coming up um, later. Actually, we are in July. So later this month uh, with the deep commissioner mm -hmm. and her solid waste team to determine how this will uh, play out. Um, the idea is, is to get that study up and going, get the money mm -hmm. authorized at a bond commission agenda so that they can actually conduct it and have results or recommendations for the start of the January session. Mm. So they got a lot of work to do uh, because, you know, the bond commission only meets once a month. Yep. Um, but at least we're setting out the parameters this month. Uh, hopefully it'll be on the agenda toward the end of August. Um, the other component of that was we were supportive of increasing the weight limits on trucks so they can mm. handle more waste. Okay. Um, the thought there is you'd actually be able to, because a lot of our waste, uh, you know, for, for some of our listeners uh, and viewers who, who may not know, we're trucking a lot of our waste out of, out state, of state to Pennsylvania yeah. and Ohio. So the thought there is um, if we can reduce the number of trucks that are going out, that's better for the environment. But also uh, it it should hopefully... It's a short-term solution. It's not a long-term solution, but it should help um, allow them to carry some more of the waste and hopefully have uh, lower tipping fees to a certain degree, or at least mitigate the increases uh, mm. going forward. So, uh, trucks being allowed pass. to carry more is more efficient, both cost and environmentally wise, fuel wise. Yes, than than Definitely. many small trucks having one bigger truck is is a better idea. Yeah, but, 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 that, but that did pass. That did not pass. And there, there was, I guess, you know, I guess uh, there's, I don't want to say confusion, but there, there was more of, you know, what was allowed during the pandemic. A lot mm -hmm. of the, the hauling community actually said, well, we had this right. We applied for it. DOT said, well, no, you didn't have the right, basically, to carry mm -hmm. have the higher waste in the truck. So everyone kind of cooled off and said, you know what, let's contemplate this during the interim session. Mm -hmm. the, the DOT commissioner also had concerns about the weight limits and what their impact would be on, let's say, roads and bridges. Roads and bridges and stuff, yeah. And also the federal authorization. He he uh, indicated that we needed to be approved at the federal level or mm -hmm. in a waiver for these increased truck limits for solid waste. They have it for dairy trucks. Mm -hmm. um, so we would... We contemplated and oh, they and, they uh, have that special waiver for the dairy trucks. Yes, they do. Okay. Yes, they do. So we were basically seeking that, and I think um, one of the things that we tried to pass, and again, you know, it, it wasn't accepted by the DOT commissioner or the legislature, was to say, you know what, let's put this in place and let's go seek the federal waiver. But let's just say, if we get the federal waiver, we can do it. You know, kind of put that step first. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there wasn't a good comfort level there. Uh, from many of the uh, folks. So we said, you know what, that's fine. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll uh, negotiate it out. And we hope to have some of those conversations over the, over the summer and the fall as well. And, you know, I don't want to say that, you know, as it came out, some of our communities were concerned about the bridges and roads as well. So yeah. I think it, it was best to take a step back. Uh, so probably toward, uh, you know, the final weeks of session, we said, well, we're going to, um, we're not going to advocate for that anymore. We'll we'll agree to talk. Uh, to look at in it the in the future. Yeah. 
Um, so another thing that was been going on with us at CCM uh, through the 119K Commission on uh, Disconnected Youth um, is something where we've heard from experts that this is an area where it's, you know something has to be done. Um, for many, that means the state has a larger role to play. What does that mean for towns and cities? You know, one of the things that we advocated this past session was getting uh, better data mm -hmm. so you can make better decisions as to how to go forward. And I think uh, we were successful there. Um, you know, as far as the data that we're looking at is who are these 119,000 kids, mm -hmm. young adults? And, you know, how can we get them reengaged with uh, not only school, but but the workforce? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, getting that data first, now we can make a, an approach. And I think what you're going to find is some of the work that the 119K Commission is doing mm -hmm. uh, will produce some recommendations, whether it's funding, but also some stuff that maybe we don't need funding for, but uh, hopefully can be addressed yeah. uh, through legislation. I think some key things uh, that we learned, and actually there was a pilot that was passed, mm -hmm. uh, there was money put aside for busing in both New Haven and Hartford for kids for after school, because I think that was one of the key things is you want to keep kids engaged, yep. and a lot of the engagement is after school activities, so this way they'd be able to ride the bus home uh, and have it subsidized by DOT in, in, the, in the state, and I think we anticipate we're going to see a lot of success with that, yeah. that maybe we can um, extrapolate that and, and go to other communities uh, throughout the state and increase yeah. that funding for the for the transportation. Yeah, I remember at uh, one of our 119K meetings that we had uh, a young person getting up and talking about how during the pandemic they got bus passes and stuff and how that allowed them to stay after and stuff because, you know, their family doesn't have a car. And, Correct. you know, and how basically, you know, if you're, doing a school activity, you're not standing around the street corner, you're not getting yourself in trouble and uh, how important that was. And just also fulfilling and, and and good for the kids to be able to get to do that stuff. It, it's, it really is an important component to their education is, is being involved in extracurricular activities. Uh, even some kids who maybe have to stay after for, for school itself, just to mm -hmm. you know, kind of brush up or, or get some uh, basic tutoring or, or uh, counseling. Yeah, um, as, but just as, just getting uh, there, not being a barrier to to those things. Yep, yeah. take that out off the table, and uh, we're pleased that uh, we were able to get a, a few dollars for that. Advocating uh, Representative uh, Jeff Curry was instrumental in that, but even mm -hmm. more instrumental than that, and he gives the credit uh, to the kids from those two communities that actually came up during the public hearing and advocated for themselves. Yeah. And uh, if anyone's interested at home, we're going to have some more 119K commission meetings coming up. Uh, end of July, we're going to be in Hartford, and there's one more after that. Uh, do you remember where that one is? Yeah, that's going to be down in uh, New London. In oh, New, that's right, New London. So check out 119kcommission.org if you want to learn more about that. Um, but back to what we were talking about before, and you mentioned this a little bit, but this sounded interesting. Um, you talked about the State Historic Preservation Officer. Um, for our listeners, what is that? You know, it, it's 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 a little complex. You know, I, I actually got an education over the last uh, month. <laughs> okay, so it's not just it me that doesn't did. know what it is. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So basically, you know, there's uh, the State Historic Preservation Office uh, comes into play um, when there's state dollars involved with a historic property mm -hmm. to determine what the impact is going to be. Now, in many communities, I think where the issue rose with us is that there was no clear process or expectation of what a town or developer uh, would go through when, mm -hmm. when going through the process. So uh, we advocated for more transparency and accountability out of the office. And I think we were able to achieve that in a special session. So people might say, well, why didn't this wait until uh, next year? It did pass the House. And it ran out of time in the Senate, and it, it was a bill that uh, we thought was important, but also many advocates, uh, particularly the Commerce Chairs um, at the Capitol, mm -hmm. you know, thought the process needed to be remedied now and we couldn't wait anymore. I think a couple key components of this bill is that now any determinations or uh, 
judgments by the State Historic Preservation Office have to be online. It's simple as that. You know, they weren't very findable. It was very difficult to see how people were being treated. And yeah. it was sort of an arbitrary process. One community might say, oh, this is great. Worked out fine. Another community, their project could be hung up for like a decade, mm -hmm. uh, you know, before a developer is able to put a shovel in the ground. So I think that's one of the things that we're looking for is a little bit more predictability, stability, and it doesn't throw away uh, historic properties. I think mm -hmm. one of the concerns that the preservation has had is that a developer would be able to just buy their way out of it. Mm -hmm. That provision was uh, eliminated from the bill. Um, and, it, and I think it was just important that there just be a more transparent process. And that's what was achieved. Now there's actually deadlines that they mm -hmm. have to meet. I think when a project is submitted, I think they have 30 days to say, this has an impact. Our office is going to get involved. Whereas mm -hmm. before there was no deadline. So it could just okay. go in perpetuity. So like, how do they decide when they need to bring it to them to start with? Like, just like if a place is old and they want to do some stuff around it, they and, need to, you know, yeah, you know, that's a great question. So as let's say a historic, let's say it's on a register. Okay, that's a historic register. Yeah. That's an easy clear cut case where it does have to go and, and deem what kind of impact it may there's or may a, not have. There's a plaque have. on the front. It says, yeah, okay. Exactly. And that could be at the state level or the national level. Mm -hmm. Where it gets a little different is when a property might be from, let's say, a house that's uh, 1850. Mm -hmm. um, it might be right on Main Street, but it, do it doesn't have that designation. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be state dollars used. That's the, that's one of the key features is Got that it. state okay. money has to be involved. And when you have state money involved, they have Connecticut has what they call SEPA, the Connecticut mm -hmm. Environmental Protection Act. Okay. Historic properties fall under SEPA. Mm -hmm. So when SEPA, or you know, go through the SEPA process, not only is it, you know, how does it impact wetlands? How does it impact the general environment? But how would Main Street uh, look if you knock down the 1850 house? Well, what, they're, what they'll say is, is you know, that SEPA process also contemplates what kind of impact Will it have on this historic property? Yeah. If any, oh, on the on the property itself too. Yes. It's not just you can't knock down that historic property, but if you built a thirty-story tower right next to it, how would that impact that place? Correct. They, they might even say, well, as long as it's tied to the property itself. Let's say yeah. a development, they have three or four um, properties that they mm -hmm. want to buy. The town wants to redevelop. They're, they're a certain area in town. Mm -hmm. The developer would put that in. If they're getting any state dollars, let's say from DECD or anyone, mm -hmm. Brownfield grant, then they have to go and submit this through the process. Mm -hmm. And then depending on what the plan is, is it a rehabilitation? Is it a renovation? Mm -hmm. Or are they looking to knock it down? Mm -hmm. You know, is it salvageable? And then that's where the historic preservation office of, yeah, there's really nothing redeemable about this project. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, you can redevelop the area. But other times they're like, oh, this has a certain architectural uh, characteristic that we want to preserve or, you know, something along those lines. You you actually saw it down at uh, Hotel Marcel. Mm. Uh, I think originally they were looking at, and that, that's down in New Haven. Uh, in the uh, old those... Pirelli building, it's a, I can't remember who, did, Evo Saarinen or maybe, some some famous architect. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I can't recall either, but it was done by a famous architect. And I think the original plan was to knock it down. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I think that developer kind of went away when they weren't able to knock it down. And the, the hotel came through and say, you know what, I think we can um, preserve the characteristics of this and uh, build it out and make it a, a you know top-notch hotel, which it is today. Yeah. Yeah, we've had some events over there, I know, and it's uh, it's really cool. So I think, you know, that, that came into play. And, uh, you know, it's so the process works. We just wanted it to be a little bit more accountable for the Historic Preservation Office. So projects so the, don't So the office is still going to do what it does and it's still going to protect yeah. the historic properties. It's just the process for doing so is just going to be more streamlined and out in the it's open. It's more defined. Yeah, better defined. 
And actually, the results of their uh, findings or, or decisions mm -hmm. will now be available to the general public. Mm. That's cool, because I mean, you know, they're talking about the history of the place. So it would be interesting to know why it's important and uh, why they decided to save places. You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM. It's just beginning of July now. Next session begins in January. How do you and your team get ready? You know, we get ready, you know, it's it's interesting. Through the policy committee process, you know, not only do we have our members uh, kind of tell us what they want to want to um, consider and mm -hmm. uh, contemplate, we also provide and precede certain issues. Special education is one. Mm -hmm. This is a perennial issue for our members. It's actually one of the leading driving costs for municipal budgets. Yeah. So we know that that is going to play forward. That kind of dovetails with what we just discussed with the 119K commission. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also just the, the reality of that the, the payments for special education just aren't keeping up with the, the rising costs. So that'll be one that we'll pre-plant and say, hey, Education Policy Committee, we'd like you to look at this issue. Mm -hmm. I think solid waste is another one. Uh, we'll probably put up uh, truck weight limits again. Affordable housing, like one of my goals this year, uh, it did pass the House. We did have some issues because it was going to prioritize funding from non-housing funds like STEEP and Urban Act and basically um, push certain towns aside as far as how those monies would be allocated uh, or prioritized. Mm -hmm. um, but for transit-oriented development, we think there's a better way. Uh, the state actually does have, um, we argue, uh, a, a TOD policy in place. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, uh, through uh, what they call MRDA, which is the Municipal Redevelopment Authority. Okay. And there's, there's like $60 million. It hasn't been authorized yet. Uh, but there's $60 million set aside to help towns with housing growth zones mm. around transit hubs. So we'd like to see that uh, maybe bolstered to some extent, but also understanding that there's advocates for the TOD or TO, they call it TOC2, Transit Oriented Communities, mm -hmm. and how we might be able to uh, resolve that issue with the funding priorities. You know, our our take was, hey, if it's housing funds that you want to prioritize, we get that. Mm -hmm. But some of these other funds that are used for senior centers, uh, you know, after school centers for ch kids, we don't think those should be uh, jeopardized or um, uh, eliminate towns from being able to pursue those. Yeah. Um, so one thing you might, you know, be an excuse kind of toot our own horns here, but at CCM meetings, we always hear from our board members them extolling the virtues of you and your policy team, saying that simply, CCM simply has the best policy team of any organization in Connecticut. Why do you think that is? You know what it is? We, we, um, we do our homework, we work hard. And I think one of the key things too is that um, we've built relationships over the years, um, you know, with the various leadership within both caucuses, both the uh, Democratic and Republican caucuses, but also the chairs and the ranking members of the respective committees at the state level, mm -hmm. um, as well as the governor's office. So I think that's one of the things that we've been able, we've built our reputation on being being straight, being candid uh, and helping. You know, I think, yeah. You know, one of the key things that I'm most proud of, is, and I think, and I think, are it's un, it's uh, directly because of our leadership with uh, Joe DeLong, is that we're not just an organization that says no. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of that used to be one of the criticism we would just say no, and I think now, uh, you know, whether it be labor issues, um, zoning issues, and all the rest, we try to work things out. We try to make yeah. it. So it moves Connecticut forward in our communities uh, forward as well without impacting them negatively. And I think that's one of the key things is that uh, we also have subject matter experts. You know, yeah. one of the things that we've done is we try to keep people within their committees. So after, you know, in many cases now we have people decades, uh, well, maybe not decades, but close to, you know, 10 yeah. years, some of them, uh, some of them are just brand new. Uh, but at the same time, we try to get them to be subject matter experts. So yeah. when they have a question, 
you know, that ranking member, that individual representative or senator calls, they know who to call. Mm -hmm. They call that individual. And, uh, you know, we give them the best answer we can. If we don't, we send it to our research team or, or, in, in, or go to some of our members and get that answer for them. That's really cool. Um, so at the end of every podcast, we like to talk about the future. Um, with a special session and our policy process, next legislative session coming up, how are you feeling? Are you feeling positive about the road ahead? I am. You know, um, I, I think, you know, you always have to, you know, watch what's uh, moving forward um, by various interest groups. And, uh, you know, we'll do that again. I think budgetarily, we're in a pretty good position. Mm hmm uh on the state level but you you've noticed some cracks within some of our municipalities because some of the the arpa funds and the education grants mm -hmm. are drying up at the federal level uh some communities have built those into their budgets as an operating cost so now we have to um see how we proceed from here yeah. so there's always things you have to watch out for i think budgetarily this this upcoming session is going to be big it's a budget mm -hmm. year and we'd like to maintain what we have, but there's some areas, as I said before, special education, general education, ECS, that uh, you know we have to be mindful of. And in fact, this past year, there was a, you know, the governor proposed to eliminate that 150 million extra that we secured the year before, before we even received it. So wow, yeah, we were able to maintain that, and I think yeah. that's just one of those things that, uh, you know, it's it's a, a, a big concern. And I, and I think you saw some budgets uh, this past year that were very tight at the municipal yeah. level. And, and we, we have to be cognizant of that uh, during the legislative session. But yeah. overall, I'm very positive about it. Well, sounds like you guys have your work cut out for you, as you always do. Um, yes. Yeah. You never know what's going to pop up either. You know, there's always an issue. You're like, oh, my God. You know, that's yeah. the one we have to focus on. Um, but I know the, the ones that we discussed, education in general, special ed. Mm -hmm. Solid ways in housing are going to be key issues this year. Good. Well, make sure you guys get out in the summer sun at least a little bit before uh, it gets cold again. Yeah. Um, and actually, if I could say one other thing. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we're going to really be um, keeping an eye on is the cost of running the early voting. Mm. So I think that's one of the things that we're going to try to get. You know, we'll have some good data points. We'll actually get the true costs. So if we need to uh, advocate for additional funding to offset those costs, uh, which which was promised, um, but I guess we're going to see how we move forward this year with that and then ultimately uh, see how we proceed there. But it, I'm kind of a proponent of early voting, uh, you know, so I hope it mm -hmm. works and uh, we'll go from there. There's also a ballot question um, that will have, you know, many, many of uh your listeners will mm -hmm. probably be interested in as to whether or not no excuse absentee balloting. So that's okay. going to be a general constitutional question uh, this year. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. And do we have a, a stance on that one or do we leave that to people to decide for themselves? Yeah, we That one we don't. Uh, yeah. We'll stay out of it um, because again, that's an individual right to vote. We, you know, yeah. it, it doesn't impact us uh, except for maybe during the early voting period. You know, yeah, some people they'll get a lot of those ballots. Uh, those count them earlier, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, Brian, thanks for speaking with us today. We really appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Thank you, uh, Matt, for inviting me, and uh, look forward to uh, coming on again. We'd like to thank our guest, Brian O'Connor. The Municipal Voice is a co-production by CCM and WNHH 103.5 FM. Christopher Gilson is our producer. Harry Draws is on the boards, and I'm Matt Ford, your host. Be sure to check out our Facebook page and give us a like, and watch out for our CCM chat series on our YouTube page.